Good morning. You can do better. Good morning. <laughs> it's good to be worshiping with, worshiping with you all today at Zion Mennonite Church. Um, really happy to see all the smiling faces in the congregation. I don't know if about you guys, but it felt like this week it was finally spring to me. Like, really spring. For a couple reasons. All the, all the cherry blossoms and the other blossoms have just been so beautiful when I've been on my walk. So that's like number one. And number two is like I start to feel a little bit of sneezing and it's like maybe time to start taking my leg rest. So those are the reasons that I know that it is spring. <laughs> um, so at this time, if anyone has announcements, now would be the time to come forward. I see one coming up. Good morning. This isn't really an announcement. It's just I want you to observe the structure outside. Yesterday we had a work crew here that did a fabulous job of putting the metal on the west wall and the gable on this end. And just wander out there sometime today to look at what's being done. What's left now is we need to connect the solar panels, which are up there. You can't see them unless you walk you know, out in the field because of the angle of the roof. But um, the solar isn't connected to the, you know, the power isn't there yet. So that still needs to be done. That's probably the biggest thing that we're waiting for is going to happen. But yeah, just walk out there. The other thing, different announcement, um, Bolivia, people that are planning to go to Bolivia, we have a group that has their tickets and are planning to go in November. And Karen and Wendell Omsitz are very excited about having company come. So there's um, five people that are planning to go in November. So um, we're still looking at more groups going next year. So that's still an ongoing thing. Let's see anybody else racing up here. So I'm assuming a good on announcements. Um, for our call to worship today, I've just been reflecting on the theme this, um, that I got for the sermon about being able to touch others with the love of God. Um, and I've just been thinking about how it feels to be loved and how it feels to give love to others. Um, how you, know, you don't need to necessarily do big things. It could be small things. But I also was thinking a lot this week about how showing love to others looks different based on how close we are to them. You know, how I show love to more of an acquaintance versus someone that's really close to me and my family. Um, and the challenges that go along with those two different groups. You know, if I'm trying to show love to an acquaintance, maybe it's because I'm a little nervous about like, well, how do I, how do I interact with them in a, in a loving way? With my family, it might be, or friends, it might be, well, we're so close, it feels like almost not blasé, but like you kind of get in a habit and you, you need to remember to show them that, that you love them. So, um, but this idea of small acts having a big impact and how can we you know, show the love of God to others, um, it's been something I've been thinking a lot about this week. For our call to worship, I'm reading um, something from um, a, a blog I found um, by Beth Merrill Neal. She's a Presbyterian minister. So um, I'll call you all to worship. To know the warmth of love, to have the assurance that someone cares, to be confident of our worth, to be bold, to love in return, to be washed over with grace, to be accepted as we are. This is to know a bit of God. Let us worship our God. So I think we'll do some singing next. How many of you have bulletins out there? Okay, I see a few. Would you do me a favor and open your purple hymnal and turn to number 809. 
And would you stick your bulletin in that slot? Okay? Stick your bulletin in that slot. We're going to make some changes this morning, so you're going to have to be awake to uh, go with the changes. Let's start with number 22. What is this place where we are meeting? Only a house, the earth, its floor, walls and a roof that shelter people, windows for light, an open door. Would you stand with me, please? Number 22. and says we're going to sing number 809 next. That's not right. <laughs> we are going to sing number 103 first. And then we are going to sing verses 1 and 3 of 103. And then you're going to open your bulletin and flip it over to, six, to 809 because we're going to sing those verses next. Got it? All right. All right. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Why am I singing this song? Because it's the music of the second song. Believe it or not. OK, let's go. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like hearts before thee, praising thee, their song of love. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, dry our fear and melt away. 
Blitz your page. Sing a new world into the being. Sound the Let's go back to the last verse of the first song. Number 103. This is the time where we bless our offerings. Um, you'll notice we have boxes uh, at the front of the, of the sanctuary and also in um, the back. You can leave your gifts there or there's also giving options online. Um, we thank you for your gifts and the way they're used to support um, God's work in our community and beyond. Um, so let's bless the offering. This is from 1019 in the Voices Together book. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things, through your goodness, you have blessed us with good gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. We receive these gifts in gratitude and offer them to the world with your love, through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And this is now the time where we pass the peace, so peace be with you. So take a few minutes to get up, um, pass the peace to others in the congregation, and we will rein you back in in a couple of minutes.
Now that you have all had peace, let's turn again to singing. One of the songs that I like in this version of the hymnal is number one. And the message, summoned by the God who made us. Number one. And now that you're all sitting down, I'll ask you to stand. Somebody's going to ask me, why did you sing the fourth verse twice? <laughs> why did you sing the fourth verse twice? <laughs> because I've been watching the news. And I've been seeing all the disgrace happening on this earth. 
That's why I sang it. Okay. Finally, number 156. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice which is more than liberty. 156. time for children's story. I'm up here by myself. Come on up. Good morning. How is everybody? I want you to help me make a list today. I would like to make a list of names that are given to Jesus. So these would be names in the Bible that people have referred to Jesus. Do you know any names? Yes, Liesl. God. Okay. Wyatt. Jesus. What are other names given to Jesus? There's one word up here behind the screen. Jesus is, what is that word? Remember? Jesus is Lord. That's a name for Jesus. Any others? Maybe the adults can help me out here. Other names for Jesus given in the Bible. Teacher? Can't hear very good. Say it again. Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb. Christ, Jesus is the Christ. What about Son of God? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Prince, of peace. Prince of Peace. Emmanuel. We sing the song, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. King is another one. Okay, I've got one more here, and I want you to read this one for me. I'm going to put a circle around it. What is that word? Mother hen? Jesus is called a mother hen in the Bible? Did you know that? S 
Mother Hen. Mother Hen. So in the books of Matthew and Luke, it is talked about that Jesus wants to gather together his people, his children, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. What do you think of that? What do you think of that image of Jesus as a mother hen spreading out her wings to protect, to care, to keep us safe as his children? What do you think of that? Pretty cool, isn't it? Jesus wants to show protection that we're safe under his wings. In one place, loving and encouraging us. So I have a little video that I want us to watch. It's just very short to remember today about Jesus being like a mother hen to us, okay? So would you go sit on the front pew? Because that's going to be a better spot to watch the video. If there's sound, you can turn up the sound, too. Thank you, God, for loving us as a mother hen loves her chicks. Thank you for your willingness to spread your soft, gentle wings around us, keeping us safe, keeping us warm, keeping us cared for. Thank you for this earthy image of a mother hen and her love for us. Amen. Um, for today, I'll be, for a scripture reading, it is Acts 3, 1 through 10. I just have to tell you, every time I read scripture, I always have this fear that I'm going to read the wrong passage. And what is Steve going to do? If I read a completely different passage than what I was supposed to, but I, I just double checked it while Jana was presenting, so I think I got it. Acts 3, 1 through 10. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have to give you. What? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Steve. Lord be with you. Okay, I need two volunteers. I know, you're wondering what. I'm not telling you what yet. <laughs> Just two. Everybody's scared. Okay, one. Thank you, Stan. One more. Okay. I know, it's easy. And y'all scared. So, this morning we're in another story uh, in the book of Acts. Just in case you're worried, Acts 2 and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that'll come. You'll just have to wait until Pentecost Sunday 
which is until May 19th. So we haven't just skipped over it forever. We'll go back, we'll circle back. If it helps, just imagine you're like one of the apostles waiting for the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. Okay, so this morning, we have another story about this new community of faith that Jesus founded and is coming into focus. It's a story about the power of God's love working through his new community to bring people together. So to help us get us, to help get us thinking about this new community, uh, I've teamed up with the pastoral leadership team. And just to refresh your memories, that's myself, Jana, and your elected elders, Andy Clome, Kara Krupp, Kristen Oaks, and Dave Yoder. So we put together uh, what's being passed out now. It's five quick questions. It's just a poll, uh, and they have to do with being part of a community of faith, uh, how you view that, and also a little bit about church membership, because those two sort of fit together. We don't really talk about membership much, and since our church constitution requires church membership for certain leadership positions, the pastoral leadership team thought it would be a great opportunity to hear from you, to gather some information, especially since we're talking about in Acts the formation of the early church. So, uh, everybody have one so far? Okay, so this is just a quick poll. Take it, you can do it right now, five short statements, and then you just circle the number that kind of fits where you're at the most. It's meant to be very simple. Uh, then once you're done with it, just pass it to the inside aisle, and then we'll collect them. Shouldn't have to do much thinking. We don't need your name even. Just circle the response and at the same time, comments aren't necessary, but if you want to write a comment, you're welcome to. Just turn it over, put it on the back, and you can write a comment. Then in a week or two, uh, we'll compile the results and show you the results. This week, also, I'm gonna work on an electronic version to get out for people that aren't here this morning. When that comes out, if you've done the one this morning, obviously you don't need to do another one. So you can just skip over the electronic one. And as you finish those, you can just pass them to the center aisle and then yeah, my volunteers, if you'll go back and pick those up. Uh, thanks. Just seems to make sense in the midst of talking about a community being formed that we invite some response. Uh, Great, thank you. Uh, so, back to Acts chapter 3. This new community. That's this new community founded on the love of God through Jesus. And that community is taking shape. In the story, it's at the gates of the Jewish temple. And at those gates, and there were multiple gates, depending on the courtyard, there's this symbiotic relationship fancy word, I had to look it up, symbiotic, but uh, nature gives us all kinds of examples. But symbiotic relationships are when two or more different parties benefit from each other. That's what was routinely happening at the gates to the Jewish temple. See, for pious Jews, prayer and almsgiving went hand in hand. They were Together, If you were a practicing Jew, you regularly went to the temple to pray and <clears throat> you regularly gave money to those in need, almsgiving. The Jewish faith acknowledges that there are some who, for various reasons, they're unable to work for a living. So while providing someone with work was preferred, giving money to those who were unable to work was also expected to accompany 
the daily practice of prayer. So the temple gate was the perfect spot for this mutually beneficial symbiosis event to take place. The passage uses the word cripples. Cripples would gather at the gate every day because they knew those who needed to give would be walking by at some point. And then the Jews that needed to give money away, they didn't have to go looking for someone in need. They didn't really have to go out of their way. Those who were crippled had some meager but predictable income, and the expectation of almsgiving would accompany prayer. It was a mutually beneficial thing that was happening, and it happened throughout the day as prayer was happening in the temple. It happened so much that it became habit, routine for everyone involved. Jews would gather for prayer, and as they passed by, they would put coins into the hands of those in need. A routine, automatic, for all those who participated. And maybe even if you didn't participate, it was certainly expected and kind of fell into the background at times. So the story in Acts 3, it takes place within that atmosphere of regular, everyday routine. Two pious Jews... Apostles of Jesus, named Peter and John, they go to the temple, it says, at 3 p.m. for prayer. Like the routine goes, there are people gathered at the gate in need of money, almsgiving. Among the people at the gate was a man crippled from birth. Doesn't even give us his name. This man is taking part in his everyday routine. As Peter and John got close, this man asked them for money. Then, something out of the routine happened. Peter and John stared at the man. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gazed back at them. There's something here in the staring that Peter and John do. There's something in the looking that the crippled man does. In the midst of the routine, walking through the gate, Peter and John they see a man who's been there every day, but they see him differently. He's no longer an item on their religious to-do list of almsgiving. Peter and John see this man and they're snapped out of their routine or maybe just disturbed out of their routine. Don't really know, but Peter and John are not the only ones pulled out of their routine. This man who's been crippled from birth He's also caught in a routine. He's brought by someone, it says, to the same gate each day. And each day he goes through this same routine of asking people for money, dependent on the generosity or level of guilt or shame each person feels in that moment as they pass by. I can imagine that it wouldn't take long for this man to stop seeing faces of people to stop seeing their potential looks of shame or judgment about why he's there. And he would just see a chance for a few coins. See, he, he knew it was all about the percentages. The more you ask, the higher chances there are of getting something. And Peter and John, they're just one more chance to increase the odds of getting something. But... In this interaction, something pulled this man out of the routine. Peter tells him, look at us. So the man gazed at them. Okay, so I realize this story, all it says is that there was this looking. Peter and John stared at the man, the man gazed at them, and the writer doesn't really go into more detail about what this looking accomplished or why it's in this story. But the writer didn't need to say anything about how they looked at each other. The story would have been easy to tell and leave out the looking part. Peter and John were going to the temple to pray and they walked by a man that asked them for money. They said they didn't have any, but that they will give him what they do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. Same story. There's just no intent looking or staring or gazing. The man is healed. 
Jesus gets the credit. But that's not how the author, the writer, tells this story. So there's something in this looking, a sense of recognition, breaking into the mundane routine of everyday occurrence. Peter and John, I think they recognize the humanity of this man that they've passed by so many times, potentially even given money to before in the past. They see him anew. And this man recognizes that Peter and John are more than another chance for some spare change. There's this type of recognition, and that recognition is part of the kingdom of God. Recognizing and honoring the humanity of others, it's a priority for this new community that Jesus has been forming. The good news of God's kingdom is happening as these people stare and look and recognize the humanity in one another. Giving financially to those in need, well, that's essential. It was essential back then, it's essential now. But when we don't take the time to look at and recognize the humanity in those who give and those who receive, we miss out on the fullness of the kingdom of God. Those who give are always at risk for being seen as another dollar sign, another donation, just as those in need are always at risk of being seen as an annoying burden. While Peter and John don't have money, in the midst of recognizing the humanity in one another, they're able to give this man what they do have, restoration in the name of Jesus. The man is healed and the man goes about praising God, causing quite a stir in the temple courtyard. He still isn't named, he's just referred to as the man who used to be a cripple. The good news of the kingdom of God often causes quite a stir. Being part of this new community centered on Jesus means seeing the humanity in others. It means seeing God's divine fingerprints on other people, even and especially those whom we find it easy and routine to regularly pass by. This text invites us to look beyond what we see on the surface. For Peter and John and this crippled man, the staring and the look at us is a moment when they recognize one another as children of God. This text invites us to recognize God's divine fingerprints in those we routinely walk by or casually interact with. Often this starts at home. That's because that's usually where we quickly become too comfortable to notice. But this applies in other areas of our lives as well. As a cripple, this man could only access certain areas of the temple. Way back in the Old Testament, Leviticus 21, it says that those with physical deformities were only allowed so far in the temple gates. Having been healed, This passage, Acts 3, 8, it tells us that this man enters the temple with them, with Peter and John. This man is a member of the restored Israel through his identity with the apostles, and therefore a part of the church. He now has the same access in the temple as Peter and John do. He can go where Peter and John go, and they go together, and it causes quite a stir. We might not have much money to give. Recognizing the humanity of others and giving them what we do have, well, that's not just about money. That includes access. There are places that I can go, privileges that I experience. Over the years, I've learned that as a pastor, I can put my church business card down on the welcome desk of a hospital or a nurse's station, and I can get access to patients that maybe not everyone has. I learned that at times, even in the midst of COVID. 
Access in our culture often follows informal and unspoken rules in other places as well. But that doesn't make it any less real. Recognizing the humanity of others includes doing what we can to improve access to things like education and housing and medical care along with basics of food, water, and clothing. In God's kingdom, we have the ability. We can give generously, but we can also give our time and our effort. We can give the gift of time, time to stop our busyness, pause the routines of our day and look at someone and value their humanity in a new way and invite them to value our own. This is something that many already do. There's a long list of organizations that help us do this. Organizations help, and I think sometimes organizations help because maybe at times as individuals we've, well, forgotten to. The goal is the seeing, not just the giving. You can volunteer, you can partner with many organizations that recognize God's fingerprints on others, the humanity of others, recognize the value Things like the Canby Center and Aware Food Bank and Woodburn, Mennonite Central Committee, Mennonite Disaster Services, and many other acronyms that we have. Vida Feliz in Bolivia, Bridging Cultures. One organization I've been learning about recently is called Mennonite Economic Development Associates, or META. For our response this morning, to this notion of recognizing and being invited to see the renewed humanity in others. We're going to hear from Caleb Longnecker. He's here representing Meta, and he's going to share a bit about what Meta has been up to and how the work they do recognizes not just the financial needs of others, but works to recognize the humanity of those in need by creating business solutions to poverty around the world. Caleb, come share with us. Let's welcome Caleb. Thank you, Steve. It's a powerful message, a powerful story that we've been studying here this morning. It's great to be back here at Zion. It's been a number of years. I've, uh, I bring greetings from uh, my home in Goshen and my home congregation of East Goshen Mennonite Church. I was telling Steve this, and, and springtime here in Hubbard and Canby is just incredible. I could drive Whiskey Hill Road back and forth all day long. It's beautiful. Thank you for letting me share a little bit about Mita's mission with you. Um, this community, this church community has been very involved, involved with Mita over the years, including uh, having board members participate with us, um, prayers, financial gifts, over many years and just wanted to say personally thank you so much for that. MEDA stands for Mennonite Economic Development Associates, like Steve said, and our mission is business solutions to poverty. My wife Nina and I lived in Ecuador and this was really where my passion for international development and thinking about solutions to poverty really began. I saw and experienced poverty, the face of poverty, in a way that I had never before. While we lived there, we lived with this tension about how best to use our money to do the, the most good for the need that we were seeing around us. We wrestled with wanting to give silver and gold out of our pocket to alleviate short-term needs of the people that we saw on the street as we passed by. But we also desired long-term solutions. And this was my experience in Ecuador in wrestling with these concepts of longevity that led me to Mita. If we could move just to the next slide. I have a couple slides here. On a macro scale, this is sort of what I envision as the road to stability or to stable societies. When there are disasters or war or conflict, we need to be contributing resources quickly, providing humanitarian aid, food, water, and shelter. There are a lot of organizations that respond well to these efforts, 
including MDS, MCC, as Steve had mentioned, along with others. Mita complements their work at this next level of stability building, which means we ex focus exclusively on long-term systemic solutions for full alleviation of the poverty experience. Job creation and income generation are our North Star. If we can enable a system that allows someone to earn a stable income for their family, everything else in their life starts to become easier. Access to health, nutrition, housing, education for their children. Our shared belief is that all people may unleash their God-given potential to earn a livelihood provide for families and enrich communities. This is, how, this is our vision, this is how we look. We recognize the kingdom of God, honoring of humanity and human potential. And as Steve mentioned, restoration in the name of Jesus. We all know the saying, if you give a person a fish, you can feed them for a day. If you teach a person to fish, they'll never be hungry again. At Mita, we take that metaphor to the extreme. Does that person also have nets? Do they have access to a loan that's not an outrageous interest rate? Is there a place where they can go and sell that fish for a fair price? At Mita, we specialize in creating jobs related to agricultural food systems. And we do this because one, we have a lot of expertise in ag. Two, we can simultaneously take on the challenges of poverty and hunger together. And three, most of the world's people, poorest people, are smallholder subsistence farmers. We have found that instead of working indiv with individual people, it's actually a more efficient poverty intervention strategy to focus a step higher in the value chain and work to help grow businesses. Our most common form of poverty intervention is working with small and medium enterprises, small and medium businesses, who are food processors or food aggregators who would then be sourcing from individual farmers. So instead of giving a micro loan to a farmer, for, let's say for fertilizer, we can promote the, the growth of the regional business that supports that farmer. If we can help grow the business, the regional business, and that business can now incorporate refrigeration for example, then they are able to source from more smallholder farmers and now more families in that community have income. And you can kind of start to see how that takes place. And furthermore, now that we've helped that food processor grow their business to a place where they can accept more from producers, that relationship between the processor the pr and the producer, the farmer, that can exist forever. Mita can kind of step back and there's no more dependency on that system. And that's sort of the sustainable uh, practice of the poverty intervention. The three key targets that we really focus on in terms of access, access to capital, we share knowledge in best, about best practices in running your business, training on agricultural practices, maybe that's accounting systems, and we connect the dots to supply chains and exports. The really cool part, I think, is how we fund all of our work. What we do is we pool together our collective donations and we attract large institutional funding from partners. So when we, when we go to uh, institutional funders like the Gates Foundation or MasterCard Foundation or USAID, and they see that we have a community of support that, and we're bringing skin to the game, that really gets them excited. And we can attract large grants that really help extend the impact that we can make. It's very efficient because every dollar, I know that every dollar that I give, it will be leveraged at least seven times for impact. For example, our program in Ethiopia, as MEDA supporters, we are putting up uh, one million of our community donations, and the Canadian government is chipping in 19 million. So you can start to see some of the leverage ratios that we can, we can uh, attract. The Guatemala project that uh, I just visited in January, we are contributing 300,000, uh, the Canadian government's putting in five million. Uh, 
Our Haiti programs, we're putting in half a million, and the USAID is contributing 12 million. And I heard from very good sources at USAID recently that we would not have gotten that 12 million if we had not had half a million uh, of our own to put towards that project. That's the power of the impact that we can have as a community, sharing and supporting this mission to, together. And I'd be happy to chat more about some of our, our programs and the ways that you can be involved afterwards here. But at the end of the day, it's not just about increasing coffee yields or raising chickens for eggs or getting a good price for yucca. It's about allowing all of God's people the opportunity to live a prosperous and dignified life, to get up and walk. I want to personally thank you for your participation in that shared vision and the vision that I believe Jesus, and in this case, Peter and John, invite us into. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. We do have a church potluck today that all are invited to. I'm assuming Caleb's going to stay and enjoy that food and fellowship, and if you'd like to talk to him further. For our prayers of the people, please turn in your voices together to 985. 985. <coughs> letter F. Letter F on the call to intercession, 985 and letter F. In these prayers today, of course, we want to lift up the work of Mita, providing for families and a way to alleviate poverty. Also, we want to remember those in our congregation with ongoing health concerns who are recovering from certain health concerns, we want to remember them today. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Gracious God, we bring our prayers to you as acts of love for you and for our neighbors. God of mercy, We pray for ourselves and those dear to us. God of mercy, we pray for our community and for our neighbors. God of mercy, we pray for the church. God of mercy, and we pray for the world. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for other concerns we carry in our hearts. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Please turn to Voices Together 831, and I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing this as our sending song, 831. Let's change our number to 813. 813, thank you.
Go in peace.